Hall of Fairfield is the Emmy nominated sound editor for Game of Thrones. She won the award last year for uh she won the uh she won the award no in 2015, sorry, for the episode <laughs> Hard Home. She's competing this year for uh the episode The Long Night. So she's uh been used to editing battle sequences. And I'm at Noble of Gold Derby here to ask her from all the episodes of Game of Thrones that you've done the sound work for, which one, ha which which a moment has been the most powerful? Oh God, it is one of the most extraordinary seasons for so many reasons. There was so much stuff that stretched us as a team so far, um, and uh, you know I think we're all very proud of the end result. The long night in particular was, I mean, a thing that tested everybody on the show, I think way beyond what any of us thought we were capable of doing. And um, <clears throat> the extraordinary nature of it, the complexity, the layers, um, um, the <laughs> insane stamina needed to just get through it, um, I think is a very proud moment. I, I loved so many of the episodes this year. And I think they all, for me personally, as a sound designer, stretch me in a million different ways. And um, I just a very honored and privileged to be part of such a, a magnificent season of, uh, of TV. You know? mm. so. well, let's, well, let's uh, talk about The Long Night, which sure. uh, is the episode you're nominated for. What was the most challenging thing for you to do the sound editing for in that episode? You know, the the... I mean, the entire episode had so many elements to it and so many layers. And um, in terms of my job as the designer, um, trying to come up with uh, elegant ways of expressing and telling the story, you know, one of the things that people complained about in a way was the darkness of the show. And it's ironic, I, you know, the point was to place you, the viewer, in the battle. And that, you know, it was at night and it was in storm and it was um, disorienting and often not knowing what was happening. And to tell the narrative to express um, the terror and the overwhelmingness of, you know, for instance, an endless supply of millions and millions of whites, for instance. I mean, one of the first challenges in that whole arc was the approach of the whites on the onslaught and just that opening um, as we start to maybe hear something in the wind, you know, the tension, the buildup, all that stuff. We imagined and reimagined that very specific, it's about a 12 minute run uh, where it starts to kind of unfold and we're waiting for them to arrive. Um, we imagine and reimagine that in many different ways. We tried so many different kind of interesting angles. And as a designer, it meant for me, I had to kind of come up with all kinds of layers of things because we, you know, until, I mean, there were so many ways of structuring and trying to find the most effective um, for the creators, for Dan and Dave to really feel that the story was being told and to find that kind of pocket for them. It was incredibly challenging. I think it was one of these shows that it was so enormous, it was hard to even imagine it in its entirety. So it was really a matter of working as a team to kind of structure and shape this piece. And, you know, one of the interesting things that we had established in other seasons, and had I known what was coming, I might have a couple of years ago suggested some stuff, but we didn't know. I had no idea where we were going. Um, you know, one of the things that was established was that the whites don't make any sound except when they're attacking or dying. So how do you convey the sound of the approach of this menace that's coming? Um, what do you do? And so there was all kinds of uh, different things that we try. And in the end, what you experience in the piece is what we settled on, which I think was highly effective and used um, all kinds of layers of things that we had come up with. So one of my challenges, the first challenge, was to express the the, um, the sheer amount of, of the force, the size of the force that they were facing. 
And, you know, the first thing I started to do was we had over the years created quite a fairly substantial library of vocalizations of, of bone movements of, um, of feet um, in snow, all that kind of stuff. And so I actually dug through and took all the stuff that we had accumulated and um, created basically a, a bunch of libraries of stuff. And I took those libraries and I poured them into an incredibly fabulous tool called Sound Particles and started creating sort of um, waves of movement and the waves forward and back movement, side to side movement, movement from all around so that you're kind of immersed in this nasty mess of, you know, horrible cockroaches that are running and screaming and, 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 uh, and threatening. It was, it was something else. And, uh, you know, and on top of that, the visual effects kept evolving. So they were adding more and more whites and we were responding on our end by adding more and more detail. And uh, it, was, it was really a massive team effort to kind of shape that. And then on top of that, um, to help with the disorientation, you know, so I did a big weather pass, it was just, winds and ice and crazy whipping stuff and you know all kinds of weird things flying around and you know to help create the kind of feeling of disorientation and um you know where the dragons were cut off kind of from their people on the ground so they you know they had a plan in place but then then you know the uh white walkers created this storm that kind of thwarted their efforts to help one another. And so to do that and to, you know, create this sense of, you know, being lost and not knowing what the hell was going on. And by the way, in the darkness, what you had as a viewer was just the sonic elements to help. Sometimes you couldn't like literally see anything else. And so you are, you know, listening and you are being directed through kind of these masses of bodies and nasty fights Sonic, completely sonically, which seemed to make a lot of people very uncomfortable. It's like everybody needed to see everything, but if you were in that battle, that was part of it. It was the disorientation, it was the night, it was the way the White Walkers were using the forces of nature to, um, you know, to to beat everybody down and, and make, you know, make it so that, you know, the Whites could penetrate the wall and come over the top and do all their nasty deeds. Um, and then finally, on top of that, I had to deal with uh, the dragons. And, and, you know, at the end of season seven, when Viserion turns and becomes, you know, an ice dragon. And, you know, I remember imagining, you know, with the blue fire and the calls and stuff, it's like, you know, I tried to, I learned, I learned from other seasons to try to imagine what would be coming and to try to create the design such that there was some place to go and they started adding more stuff. And in my wildest dreams, it was a battle between one dragon, you know, a live dragon and a dead dragon. I did not imagine an air fight between all three. Mm -hmm. And so that was insane. With the dragon vocals in particular this season, it, it was interesting because we spent so much time for the first time we spent time with Ray Gal. We didn't really get to know him in the past. We knew Drogon well, but we didn't spend a lot of time. Suddenly we're riding Regal with John. And then all the emotionality that came when Regal gets killed. And and then at the end with Drogon when he, you know, discovers Danny's body and and that emotionality. So for me, in addition, it was expanding the palette emotionally for the dragons to to express all that stuff and and to um to make that a rich experience, to be able to express what was going on through them meant that I had to completely expand the palette, you know, the year. And so there was a ton of challenges. I mean, it was so multi-layered and all of those things came into the long night. I mean, every single one of them, you know. It was a big episode. A lot was going on in the, in the long <laughs> night. Um, the, um, you, you talked about how when you, were when you were designing stuff, you left room uh, for it to grow and for it to expand as you're working through this series. Um, when you got to the last couple of episodes, 
did you did you have a different mindset where you're like there's there's no more season coming there's nothing it needs to expand into i can just throw it all at the wall now yeah no it was and that was what this season was about laying it out laying it all on the table you know putting it all there and you know it culminated in in drogon screech to the sky mm. you know and his burning of the throne i mean it was kind of for my journey with the dragons, it was kind of a, a fabulous closure, you know? It broke my heart. And I remember cutting the last wings of Drogon as he flew off and going, oh my God, that's it. That's, that's, that's it, We're, that's the end, you know, never again. And oh, and one of the other interesting things of this season was so much flying, you know, with the dragons on the dragons, then flying around and stuff, the wings actually became this gigantic element this season mm -hmm. because, um, because there was, you know, so much time spent and, and they became a really interesting element for transitions to, and also the, the ultimate expression of their size and their power in these scenes. And so I spent an enormous, probably ridiculous amount of time um, crafting the wings and, and giving elements that made them very tactile and sensual. And one of my favorite sequences in The Long Night is actually one of the quietest when the dragons all come up above the clouds and you see um, Rhaegal and Drogon and it's very quiet. Suddenly they come out of the action and come up and there's just all you hear is just this light wind and the flapping of wings before the, they then dive back down or at another moment when um, uh, when the Night King comes flaring up with the ice dragon. I mean, those moments are so gorgeous. So we could go from really this delicate beauty to the kind of crazy raging power that were the dragons all the way through that episode that were, you know, of course, Drogon, you know, burning the city in, in, in five and uh, culminating in his dance and scream of sorrow to the sky, you know, and, and um, his tender carrying of Danny away at the end. I mean, it was um, a huge ride this season. It was amazing, actually. Well, I was gonna ask you uh, as a sound editor, uh, what's more important, the big sounds or the moments of silence? Oh, you know, it's all of it. I mean, it's all about dynamics, you know, especially in something like uh, The Long Night, which is so bombastic and it's so, I mean, people told me they were absolutely exhausted and spent by the end of it. I mean, it was hard to watch as a viewer to get through that, you know, let alone to be building it. But the moments of silence help give you a moment to go, <sighs> take a deep breath and dive back in. And because if we don't have those moments and it's all bombastic from beginning to end, at some point the fatigue is so overwhelming, people start to check out. You can't stay attached, you know, at 12 for the entire time. You've got to, you know, the peaks and valleys help kind of give um, places to breathe and also make the loud moments more dynamic because you've got, you know, moments of silence around. Otherwise, there is a fatigue that starts to set in. And at some point, if you just keep it on 12 going, it starts to sound very quiet in a weird way because your ears will naturally check out. So dynamics are incredibly important, especially in something like that. And I think the mix team, um, and the creators did an insanely good job at creating pockets like that. And I mean, episode five in particular is just this insane, beautiful poem of, you know, it's like a, a poem of survival. And the way they were able to just pull you out of the destruction and the crazy sounds of that and focus in on the breaths of one person. And you get to follow that in their headspace and, and how disorienting that was, but it, it was such a poetic way of doing it, but that was all done on the mix stage with such loving care and craftsmanship. It's absolutely extraordinary, I think. It's, um, I love three and five is like this bookend to it that is so beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful piece of cinema. Yeah, no, some lovely moments. Um, what, what, what's your favorite moment on Game of Thrones from the whole run of the show? Oh, dear God. 
I don't even know how to answer that. I mean, what what, know, what 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 do you when you think of Game of Thrones, or like, and you look back on your time there? What's the moment that sticks out? What's the first thing that comes to mind? I mean, one of my first sequences that I did was the plaza scene, and that was the beginnings of me getting my feet wet mm. and expressing. And I think um, I've talked about this in interviews, but I was going through some really personal great deep personal trauma when I started the show. It came to me in a moment in one of my darkest moments and the show kind of saved me and what I discovered in the plaza scene, so I had had several of my family, family members pass of cancer very close to one another and yeah. right then. And my sister in particular had just passed and the first thing I did was work on that sequence and it had the full range of emotion. And what I discovered, I, I was in such deep throes of pain at that time. I had no other place to put it. I had never, never sought to add such great emotionality to my work. It, it naturally had to go there, if that makes sense. And what I discovered, the reaction, I rem I'll never forget it. The reaction from that, that episode for me, when people said that they were moved by that scene, and I was moved. I was having my own kind of emotional stuff going on and was expressing in that. I, I started to dis I discover the power of being vulnerable and emotional in the work, infusing it in the work, and how, as a viewer, as a listener, you receive it through your own, through your own glasses and through the voices of the dragons in this case. But suddenly we're, we're connected we're having a dialogue and it became a source of communication and it became a source of my own personal healing. But I also realized that it made for a richer viewing experience when the viewer feels something in the work, it opens them. You know what I mean? And suddenly the experience becomes much deeper and richer. And as I started to understand that, and work with that and seek that out in every scene. I can tell you every scene and what it, how it was personally connected to me and how I, what I poured into it, you know, because each one was almost like I started going through these and it was like an expression of my place in time, but it allowed me to express that through this piece. And it became this like really power, it's become a very powerful element of my own work and something that I will take with me going forward for the rest of my days. I cannot turn back to what the kind of work I was doing before. You know, it was a personal, that was a personal pivotal moment for me. I mean, I have loved so many of the sequences, so many of the elements. Um, there's just so much stuff. I mean, it is one of the most, I don't know, it, it has been, it is one of these things that, one can ever hope for in a career and it came to me in this moment and continued on for like you know six years you know and it is like my god i mean and then to be able to fully express the burning of the throne at the end and and to pour all that stuff into drogon's um expression of i mean in some way his screaming at the sky and his cries in the sky were kind of echoed by fans who didn't want the damn show to end and they started screaming and yelling and it's like this insane you know culmination of expression of emotion that in some ways we were all experiencing because you know well the fans didn't want the show to end i mean all of us you know it's like we literally started to feel lost like what would our lives be after and you know in many interviews i know people have probably read and heard with many of the actors and you know with kit Amelia and all, you know, Sophie and all the people, you know, they've expressed their own personal journeys through the course of the show and how they've grown and changed and what the ending of the show and the anticipation of that felt like and how it felt like the bottom kind of felt dropped out at the end. And I felt like I was able to put all my angst and feelings of that in that powerful screech to the sky. You know, it was, it was kind of the perfect for me. It was kind of the perfect ending, you know, and perfect ending to my own journey on this show.
Well, it could be an even more perfect ending. Uh, Game of Thrones has uh, more Emmy nominations this season than any other uh, show has had in a single season before. And you were nominated again uh, for Best Sound Editor for the episode The Long Night. So it could be an even more perfect ending with you taking out that Emmy Award again and winning your second Emmy for Game of Thrones, uh, Paula. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us today about Game yeah, of Thrones pleasure. and pleasure. about the awards. And uh, for people watching this, you can go to goldderby.com where you can compete against experts, uh, editors, and prognosticators to see if you can be the best awards predictor in the business. That's at goldderby.com. And